Hello. Welcome again to Bergson and the Holographic Theory of Mind. Ongoing, part 22. We'll call this Tesla 2, or what is a field? Now, the field exemplar is magnetism. We have action at a distance in the field. The questions we'll look at is, what is a pole? What's magnetic attraction? An AC generator is an inverse magnet. The whole notion of counter space again and energy. We'll be looking at the quantum mechanic relation of this field conception to what is light, a photon, an electron, the double slit experiment, the Broglie's solution, and what is a field, what is a space, and ultimately touching on the non physical basis of action. So why field? Well, one, at the heart of Bergson is a psychophysical field, as I've noted. The nature of this field is at the core of the question, how do we act? How does an image move or coalesce from the virtual to bring it about action in the body, in matter? This question goes under the guise, how does the mental act upon the physical? But as we've seen, we have a continuum. Matter is a special case of the field. So the question could be, what is the nature of the virtual? That is, the nature of the field in which the body is embedded. Secondly, physics is the keeper of the field, or a field theory. But physics has, in truth, no answer to what a field is. Maxwell and his equations of electromagnetism notwithstanding, as we'll see, the current dominant theme is particles. But the question then becomes, how do particles make a field? There's really no conception of this. So the plan I've got is to have us dive into the heart of the field question. And that'll be diving into the magnetic, the dielectric, the electromagnetic. All of the above are supposedly solved, static. Static subjects, old, settled, settled science, so-called, old hat. This is not the case. Rather, these subjects have just been effectively dropped, pursuit halted, solidified, fossilized. We'll see how deep is the subject of a, subject of a field and how far a field physics could be. So one goal is create an awareness, a background knowledge about this fundamental subject that for further that current physics can be played against. I'm thinking of a coming future part on the holographic principle, a current principle in physics. Lots of discussion on it. My prediction there's going to be a bit of shock at the pure scholasticism of the physicists. But my main goal, a glimpse of the path we may have to take in physical theory to solve the problem of action, will, and thought. So we begin with magnetism. There was just a video interview with Richard Feynman, the well-known quantum theorist. And he has asked simply, What's going on between two magnets? Implying, of course, what's going on in terms of attraction, repulsion of the magnets. What follows is several minutes of disturbing dissembling from Aunt Minnie slipping on the ice to the nature of ice to the difficulty of describing the slipperiness of ice and ending with, quote, it's just one of the four fundamental forces. It can't be explained in terms of anything you would understand. So why did Feynman struggle? Well, in an, another book, of course, he gives magnetism, magnetism a shot by describing it in terms of virtual particles. Unfortunately, virtual particles are not much more than phlogiston used by current theorists by which one can explain just about anything. Rather, I would say it's because physics 
save for the now forgotten early pioneers of electromagnetism, Tesla, Steinmetz, Heaviside, has ceased to penetrate into the nature of a magnetic field. So in this part, I'll be doing an extraction, a reorg, and a compression for the many short videos on this subject by Ken Wheeler. Wheeler is an admirer of Eric Dollard, whose history of electricity we followed in number 18. Ken's free book, Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism, is available on, Mag on Amazon. It's in its third edition, going, he says, shortly to number four, then on to five and six. He has that much material. And I'd note that one can start with the videos, rather better probably start with Dollard than the videos, but, but ultimately one needs to go to the book. There's a great deal of material in the book. And however, it's a difficult mind trip requiring a great deal of mental concentration, visualization, and uh, penetration of what the very difficult and different vision of physics is that he's presenting. And yes, Ken is a unique being. So we begin with the transmission lines we discussed in part 18 as described by Eric Dollard. We have two transmission lines looking end on. The lines are going in opposite directions. And around each line, we have the circumferential lines of force, that is the magnetism of phi. And then we have the dielectric lines of force, shall we say in the space between, or psi, everywhere at right angles to the magnetic lines of force. And there being the antithesis of the magnetic. So one becomes the gradient lines for the other, and one defines the other in a conjugate or mirror sense. And as we noted, these lines, as we see looking at the, the right uh, diagram, as they're forming these fields form a line all the way down, these, these transmission lines are not simply holding flows of electrons up and down, and, and, and rather, rather they're dielectric reflectors of the field, the, the electromagnetic field, include the dielectric and the magnetic component traveling down the field at, at the speed of light. So this is a quite different view of what these lines are. And as, and as we noted, the crossing points in this diagram are the electromagnetism in this complex field. If you put a black diagram over the top of these, this representation of the wires, the outlined in red area defines a bar magnet. The green line is the line of inertia. And more, this is the follow on the line of inertia. There's no difference between the wires and the permanent magnet, except one the permanent magnet is a di dielectric electrified object created so from charge to capacitor banks into an induction coil, which spins up a specific magneto dielectric incommensable geometry that makes the permanent magnet, as, was, as we'll see. You have dielectricity and you have divergent reciprocating lines of force. So to understand the reciprocating, we're going to take some three-dimensional views of the magnetic field. So this is the positive image, the spatial image, and that's a special word here, of the lines of magnetic force, or phi. If one wraps the circumferential lines of force of those wires around, let's make a very short length of wire, let's say, one inch long pair of wires, as I've, showed, I've indicated in the center there uh, with the uh, yellow circles going around, you could see you can make a donut easily with those surrounding lines of magnetic force. Now I said spatial image because magnetism is associated in this whole matrix of thought with 
space or the projection of space from the ether. And the ether is inner space, or as we shall see, the counter space. So we're going to have this constant playoff of outer projective space, which is magnetism and inner space, which is the, or counter space, which is the dielectric. So as it's the projection of space, that is magnetism, it's simultaneously the image of the loss of inertia, which is, as we shall see, the dielectric or counter space. So what we have is this donut or torus expressing magnetism. And the question is, what is the negative image of the donut? And this is where we bring in counter space. If you take the negative image, you'll see within that an hourglass shape. This is the hyperboloid. The hyperboloid is the counterspatial sink, the vortex defined in correlation with the divergent force in motion. This reciprocates at a frequency. It's called the Lamour frequency. The mean rate is 49.6 megahertz. Magnetic resonance imaging machines have to be adjusted for this particular frequency. And we'll, have to, we'll go into this frequency or the source of it a little bit more coming up. So here we have the plane of inertia. There's no magnetism at this plane or line. If we tried to stick a little piece of iron right exactly along aligned along that plane, it wouldn't stick. This plane is termed normally the block wall, called a domain wall, supposedly, separating magnetic domains or a transition region, so-called. But this is nothing but a description. It's just a name, the block wall. In reality, it's the dielectric accretion disk of centripetal dielectricity. And that's why there's no magnetism at this plane, because it's pure dielectricity, not magnetism. It is similarly, or likewise, the point of spatial divergence. Again, remembering the donut that we'd also be visualizing here is the expression of space or magnetism. And that's also the point then from which we have the spatial divergence, or this plane is the point of spatial divergence into magnetism or actual space. So space in this matrix, in this framework, is a posterior relational attribute arising from this divergence, the divergence from the dielectric into magnetism. So a note of caution here, we're talking the plane of inertia, but by inertia, we mean the inertia of the dielectric. It is not bodies resisting stopping or bodies resisting motion as commonly denoted. It is the antithesis of phenomena such as bodies in motion, bodies moving into places. It is incalculable. And we'll see more on this as we go. So magnetism and dielectricity move 180 degrees opposite. The picture shows 90 degrees, and the question is, why? Well, in the creation of a magnet, dielectricity is accelerated via electrification, the electric current. But, but in magnetism, this is a, a binding system. The acceleration of the dielectric creates this conjugate double, double hyperbola which is the max throw of an inverse spear in a dielectric inertial plane. It's like a dog tied to a chain. It can only go so far. The maximum throw is this double hyperbola and accretion of dielectricity. If you cut this configuration 1,000 times along its polarity, you'll end up with 1,000 of these systems with north and south poles. We, so we really don't have polarity, it is radiation which leaves centrifugally 
and divergently and returns centripetally. So what we have in the magnet is a field that looks like the right, the magnet being outlined in red. We have the centrifugal or divergent magnetism leaving, we'll say, starting from the top, the pole at the top, and returning centripetally in through the bottom, the red circles being the centripetal flow back to the center to the dielectric inertial dielectric inertial plane. Inversely, uh, you're going to have the centrifugal magnetism leaving from the bottom and then again returning centripetally from the top, again back down into the uh, dielectric inertial plane. The center, the blue-green, is our dielectric inertial flywheel. So this is the electrical, that is the dielectric versus magnetic incommensurability that is found within each magnet. This incommensurability is found at every point of the magnet, somewhat holographically. Cut the magnet into a million tiny pieces, this same pressure mediating structure of the two opposing ether modalities will be found in every piece. In each and every of the one of the one million pieces, you'll have this dynamic structure. Incommensurable here, meaning not having conjugate units in or of the same dimension. We have two different dimensions, magnetism and dielectricity. If we bring two magnets together, the dielectric inertial plane will form immediately between the two. This is because it is always self-seeking, just like gravity. This is why dielectricity always terminates into the creation of mass. Again, hang on for this. The same way electricity terminates into magnetism. However, termination isn't the correct word. It's radiation. All charge terminates in discharge. All divergence in convergence. We can ask which side is centrifugal, which centripetal. Again, the answer is both. The max velocity of centrifugal divergence is at the edge of any magnet. Again, at the top edge of our magnet there. A Gauss meter will show this. It's the edge of the spatial boundary where dielectricity ends and magnetism, that is space, begins. Then we have the centripetal reintegration coming into the bottom cone, and vice versa. In another picture, another look at it, the yellow circles are divergent centrifugal magnetism. Their max spin is at the top, at the widest top, like, like a tornado. The blue is the incommensurate dielectricity, which centers itself in any magnet and occupies the same space, so to speak. Again, we're talking two different spaces. It forms a space in any magnet. The red convergence circles are the centripetal returning reintegration of magnetism. And there we have the centripetal vortex, the red circles, whose max spin is at the narrow top near the dielectric plane, like an inverse drain. Got a picture of a circling centering vortex like a drain there, and, and then if we invert it, we see the max spin is at the top of that inverse drain, vice versa for the centrifugal vortex. So this is an incommensurate system again. Again, focusing on that inertial plane within the magnet, I'll just note that Wheeler in his book states that he has written data to this inertial plane, has written bits into counter that is into counter space that is not to the xy plane of a spinning magnetic disk but into the counter counter spatial aspect of that disk in other words we're not talking the same space we're talking a counter spatial aspect defined by the inertial plane of the magnet and the data can be read out the implication one implication is devices with enormous data storage huge amounts of data storage over the standard, shall we say, XY storage. Implication two, just saying what might this mean for
for the brain. This, the brain's dynamics also are going to involve this dielectric plane and counter space. Again, on the left, in this picture, in the red, the magnetic field, the walls of the magnet remove for the picture. At the center, the point of near zero magnetic field at the center of the magnet. An increasing magnetic flux density, increasing at the, at the point of centrifugal divergence on either side or pole of the magnet. On the right, the dielectric field, the conjugate field that also exists inside the magnet. It is absolutely inverse to the magnetic. Wherever magnetism is present, there is decreasing dielectricity and vice versa. So the greater the dielectricity, the less the magnetism and vice versa. The greater the magnetism, the less the dielectricity. At center again, while it shows large spatially, what it actually shows is maximum flux density of dielectric or non-Euclidean convergence. So again, the center, this would be the counterspatial point of the erasure of force and motion. That is the maximum acceleration or zero acceleration. Again, remembering force and motion is magnetism, the donut that we're not seeing here, and we're talking about the erasure of that, the um, pulling in into the counter space, into the dielectric. The point of the absolute center of any field, you will find that there is not that field. At the center of any magnet, you'll find that there is no magnetism, as we already noted. And at the point of maximum space, you'll find no counter space, you will actually find the creation of space. So there's no such thing as a field terminating in space or space acting on things and doing things. Space is really nothing other than the lack of inertia, therefore the expression of force and motion. Space is created as a posterior attribute of a divergent field. So this very much differs from current physics and general relativity where space is actually given properties. Space does stuff. Space is curved. Space bends light. Space accounts for gravity. There is no ether in space. Space is within the ether. So space is a phenomenon of the ether, a projection of the ether. So as Tesla said, who was no friend whatsoever of, of Einstein's general theory, space has no properties. He was rather astounded at general relativity and the uh, idea that somehow space has properties and does things. Again, another view. This is the hyperboloidal expression of the two fields that are always fighting each other. A magnet must always express itself out this way. The only thing that is missing in this diagram is geomagnetic precession. In other words, this is another piece of the dynamic. And this is the Lamour frequency, or involves the Lamour frequency we mentioned earlier, the 49.6 megahertz. To remember, the dielectric inertial plane is like a spinning flywheel, as in a gyroscope. Mechanical, mechanical analog of this magnetic dielectric field is the gyroscope. Therefore, like a gyroscope, you'll have a degree of precession. This is an important aspect to the total dynamic, but I'm not going to go into that here. I'll point uh, some places in can really where you can find it. So a magnet, to describe it, is a reciprocating precessional hyperboloid which extrapolates itself out in a hypertrophoidal fashion. So let's talk attraction, some preliminaries, magnetic attraction. The inertia of the ether of the dielectric is pure potential. It is counterspatial. That is, it's not in space as we understand space. It's not in this table 
and chairs and space of the kitchen spreading before me. It's encounter space. Expressing this potential or inertia is the loss of this potential. The loss becomes force and motion. And this is magnetism. Magnetism is the creation of space. For an atom, 100% of its volume, argues Wheeler, is propped up by magnetism. And Wheeler does a good deal of discussion of the atomic structure in his book, which we won't be going into here, but this is important. He's, the electricity being counterspatial is impelled with increased capacitance within the atomic structure, within the atomic structure. So we'll come back to this because we, we talked about this in 18, increased capacitance of the dielectric of the ether. And magnetism is expelled without. So these are key concepts. Magnetism is dimensional. The dielectric is interdimensional or in counter space. So there's no such thing as a radiation like magnetic radiation that attracts itself. What we have here is dielectric acceleration. It is convergent dissipation of force and motion. So what we're going to be seeing is a torus contracting the force and motion of the magnetism and simultaneously that's dielectric voidance as noted up on top of my picture there that is magnetism is being voided into the dielectric. So the iron firing filing picture on the right there would look like a spear between the two magnets. But what we're actually seeing is a shrinking torus. We have the torus, the magnetic torus, and it's shrinking as the two magnets rush together. It is actually dissipating force and motion, the force and motion of this torus, the magnetism, into the hyperboloid, which forms the negative image of the torus. So into counter space and reforming the dielectric inertial plane now centered between the two magnets. So this is the actual counterspatial acceleration, acceleration being associated with counter space that is occurring as the torus shrinks. This is dielectric acceleration. So this is not attraction. There is no force involved. In actuality, the magnets are accelerating without any force. It is actually the voidance of force. It's what Ken terms dielectric voidance. Remembering the, the, the magnets are force and motion. And when we're shrinking the torus, which is what's happening here, we're shrinking or lessening the force. And hence, where's the force going? It's turning back into the dielectric. So it's convergent field pressure dissipation. It obeys the right-hand rule of magnetic field pressure necessity, which is a torus parallel to the convergence of acceleration, where no pressure exists. Under acceleration, and under acceleration is undergoing entropy to rest inertia. So the torus is dissipating, that torus of magnetism of force of motion is dissipating into the negative image of the hyperboloid of that spatial torus, which is a dielectric field in counter space or the force and motion diversion geometry. That is, the expanding torus is becoming the shrinking torus and shrinking into the hyperboloid. This is the dissipation of the hyperboloid counter space, into, dissipation into the hyperboloid counter space. And this is, therefore, increasing inertia. So if we go to repulsion, well, we have, of course, the inverse. And this inverse is unnatural because we require a force or two forces or two little guys there pushing, pushing those magnets together. And of course, what's actually happening in the field, the blue arrows are showing the force is actually going the other direction. So this is dielectric countervoidance or divergent pressure. 
Again, it obeys the right-hand rule of magnetic field pressure necessity, a torus at 90 degrees to the divergent pressure applied, or the hyperboloid perpendicular to the force divergence. So force divergence is the blue arrows, as I said, going the other way. You still have the torus, but it is occurring 90 degrees perpendicular to the force applied, which is the two guys pushing the magnets together. So it's like an insulating donut. It's the unnatural turning upside down of nature. It's the parallel insulation of the donut. And of course, this is ultimately incompressible. You're only going to compress that donut so far. The repulsion only goes so far. It's only malleable up to a point to the limits of this forced divergent geometry. This is the principle on which a railgun is built. As you compress and compress and compress, you build up such a force that when you let it go, you shoot off a projectile at massive speed. So taking both attraction and repulsion in comparison, again, you have a torus on either side. You have the shrinking torus in the attraction, and you have the expanding torus in the repulsion, shrinking or inflating torus. Together with the hyperboloid, you have either, in the attraction case, magnetic acceleration or convergent dissipation or dielectric voidance and the in increasing acceleration it is into the into the dielectric in the repulsion case you have force and motion divergence or dielectric countervoidance and divergent pressure the, the expanding inflating torus and therefore increasing force and motion that is increasing magnetism, and this is unnatural. If we take two magnets, as we saw, they attract each other. We assume traditionally that we're dealing with unlike poles. North attracts south, south attracts north. But as we've just seen, they're not really unlike poles. Rather, we are seeking force dissipation cut up the magnet into three magnets. The plane of inertia will remanifest itself in each one of these sections at the null pressure point between the magnitude of each of these pieces. You can never cut out a north pole from a south pole. So what's the implication of something that is there, but not there? There implies a Cartesian XY coordinate. It's on the right. But if it's not there, where is it? It is nowhere, quote unquote. Time, in the objective sense, is objective time, is the measure of magnitudes. As I noted in an earlier part, I can measure time via a magnitude. Like I can declare one second to be one rotation of the disk. Each time the parrot passes the arrow, I have a second. But obviously, the length of that sec second is a function of the perimeter size of that disk. That's a magnitude. The greater the perimeter size of that disk, the longer the second, and vice versa. So I'm really measuring two simultaneities in space, parrot and arrow, and a spatial magnitude, the perimeter value of the rotation. The magnitude of a force, where force is defined as F equals ma, again, the a, the acceleration, is the second der derivative of change the position with respect to time. That is, force's magnitude is a function of temporal displacement. The inertial plane, however, in, in the magnet is no Cartesian value because it has zero temporal displacement. It has no magnitude. Anything without a magnitude has no locus, no position, no point, no value in space. 
So we have two magnets accelerating, but they are not accelerating to each other. They're accelerating, they are accelerating towards a null point. They're, they're accelerating toward counter space in up the plane of inertia. And given you cut a magnet a million times and always end up with a plane of inertia, therefore the plane of inertia is nowhere. It is in counter space. Again, even with the word in, we have a linguistic problem, like a kind of booby trap. There is no plane of inertia located in or at the middle of a magnet. It is the null point between magnitudes, between temporal displacement. So if the plane of inertia has no locus, then two magnets, north and south pole, accelerating towards each other, in reality, are accelerating towards a forming null point of inertia, where force is at its lowest pressure point in inertia. This is the pressure mediation or force dissipation we've already discussed. Inertia is pure potential. It is unmanifest. We can call it inertia, counter space, the ether. These are all one and the same thing to describe this. Let's talk for a second about attracting a non-magnetic object. For example, a piece of iron. The iron is in pressure equalization seeking mode. The field of, the, of magnetic induction causes acceleration of the iron to the magnet due to the now imbalanced field pressures in the iron. There has been dielectric contraction in the iron due to this imbalance. Since the dielectric is counterspatial, there is interatomic dilation. In shrinking the dielectric, it rebounds in opposition to the magnetic field, causing attraction. In reality, pressure equalization. The negative pressures via the dilation are being filled by the gradient of the magnet. So actions at a distance in all forms, as we're talking here, are field pressure equalization seeking sinks. We have created a centripetal, centripetal inertial vortex in the iron as flowing towards the magnet, which is why it leaps. But what defines a magnet, as, as opposed to a piece of crummy old iron, is field coherency. So coherency of fields, just like a laser, is multiplicative. With a five watt light, I can barely read a book. With a five watt laser, I have a coherent form of light, extremely field coherency of light. This will burn a hole in things. If I have one rubber band, I have a certain degree of force. If I have 10 rubber bands, I have a force that's not just additive, just not 10x, but multiplicative, say 100 times the force of one rubber band. A powerful magnet placed over an iron chunk, well, the iron chunk becomes a magnet. We have forced field coherency. But caution and note, the standard model of magnet creation is aligning magnetic domains. We have a whole series of little magnetic domains, so-called, and the magnet aligns these. But we have not, in reality, aligned magnetic, magnet, aligned magnetic domains. What we have done is force the complex field geometry and dynamics we have been discussing the centrifugal and centripetal lines of force, the dielectric inertial plane. Note that in this standard version of aligning magnetic domains, we still would have to explain now the appearance of the plane of inertia in this, what is now a magnet. Another, another view of it, we have these little magnetic domains, top unaligned, bottom aligned, but again, we could take our scissors and cut, by implication, one of these little mini magnets in half. And by that implication, we would now have a North Pole cut apart from a South Pole, which would make no sense. Again, we'd have to explain how the inertial plane forms in each of those mini magnets if we cut them. You're always forced then to this far more dynamic vision 
of the fields. And in this case, as we've been discussing, the interaction of the dielectric and the magnetic field. So opposites don't attract. Force is multiplicative, and the plane of inertia can be, be between two magnets, not at the nexus of the magnets themselves. So if we take two different size magnets, the N55 Gauss magnet is more powerful than the N40 Gauss, but yet the N55's field is much smaller. The two magnets have quite different power. The uh, N40 for the same distance will attract a certain size of iron bar. The N55 will, will attract a much bigger bar, same distance. The, the little N55 is much more powerful. Again, the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. The smaller on the right, the N55 is much closer to counter space. The left, the N40, is further away from counter space. It's more spatial, larger space. When we say the smaller the space, we mean the greater the energy, the greater the inertia, the greater the acceleration. Space, actual space, the space we live in, understand is only equal to the impotency of inertia and acceleration. Space is the inverse of energy. Continuing that space is the inverse of energy. An atomic bomb explosion is the loss of energy, the inverse of energy. A pound and a quarter ball of plutonium, that's energy, it's pure potential. The loss of that energy is force and motion. Space is force and motion, and it's magnetism. When you increase the power of a magnet, you, in, you are increasing the power of inertia and acceleration at the plane of inertia. So space is equivalent to volume, is equivalent to magnetism. Counter space is inertia and power, that is pure potential. Again, why does a smaller magnet have a more powerful magnetic field? Because power equals the dielectric. And magnetism is, in essence, impotency or force in motion as expressed in space. Capacitance is the dielectric. It's the ether, it's inertia. And the dielectric is counter space. So we talked in number 18 about saturation into counter space. Take the two wires up in the right for a moment, the red circles being the two wires. Imagine them going down the line. And we place a piece of glass in the middle. And if we raise the voltage, the glass sucks in ever more dielectric lines of force. The closer we move those wires, the smaller we make the space, the more concentrated the dielectric lines of force become. If we keep raising the voltage, the glass absorbs even more and more dielectric lines of force until it reaches a point of saturation, at which point there's actually a break line that occurs because of the stresses and there's an explosion. And of course, this is the type of phenomenon that leads to explosions or discharges down those lines. Also, we have a dielectric field between the cloud and the earth, and we start talking about lightning. There's a powerful dielectric field. But again, that dielectric field, there's a saturation inward, inward into the in dielectric field, an increasing saturation of dielectric force. Ultimately, there's such stress in the atoms, there's a stress line, and there's a discharge of electricity, lightning, through that, that stress line, the discharge of the dielectric. But what, what we have here in both cases is saturation into an increasingly smaller space, into counter space. So the less power, the more magnetic, the larger the magnet or the greater the volume. Volume is magnetism, that is space. Magnetism is volume. Again, we're saying magnetism is behind propping up space. So force and motion, is force is always divergent. We have centrifugal divergence. 
And this is, in actuality, impotency and the loss of power. So, again, to illustrate a bit, how does an electromagnet work? Like in our nice junkyard there. Well, electricity doesn't create magnetism. What's happening is electricity loses its dielectric component, which is lost in counter space in the coil, which leaves only pure magnetism. You see in the picture on the right, what we have is a, a battery, a source of electricity, a coil around, around our nail, and it's normally conceived that that electricity flowing around the coil is creating the electromagnet, which can pick up the pins, similarly for the crane in the junkyard. But what is happening when you throw in an enormous amount of electricity is, well, electricity is composed, as we discussed heavily in Part 18, we'll, just, and we'll discuss again, is composed of dielectricity and magnetism. When you dump out the dielectric, the only thing you're left with is an enormous amount of magnetism which gives you the tremendous power of the electromagnet. Again, if we take two Mori patterns, one with clockwise flow, one with counterclockwise, and merge them, we get something that looks like this. This is the, the exact result of these two patterns. I couldn't find the exact Mori pattern that would be matched, but this is close enough. Then what we would see under, if we put a magnet under a ferrocell, it's something very similar. Now a ferrocell is two optically, super optically flat disc between which is sandwiched a layer of ferrofluid, less than a micron thin, ringed with a set of LEDs shooting inward. So here is an image of the lines of force, centrifugal and centrif centripetal as in the Moria patterns of the magnetic field. The bright spots of light under this ferrocell cell are where the centrifugal and centripetal lines cross the intersections of inverse polarity radiations. Another picture, again, how a magnetic field must extrapolate itself. Again, you can see, because these, this ferrocell cell fluid is so thin, you can see the, the uh, experimenter's hand Underneath the cell, you can see books and shelves in the background, and you see the outline of the magnet in the, the red circle the hand is holding, but you can see the continued extrapolation beyond the boundary of the magnet of the centrifugal and centripetal lines of force. As another illustration, let's consider the nature of an AC generator. So we have a magnet above, at the dielectric inertial plane, we have the reciprocating magnetic fields north and south. And now what we need is a dielectric ref reflector. So what is a dielectric reflector? Well, a copper coil. So we take our magnet and put it inside a copper coil or a dielectric reflector. Remember in our discussion of the wires of part 18, the wires are dielectric reflectors. They're not carrying current, they're the guides for the field going down the wires. So we have a spinning magnet inside a copper coil. So what's the simplest explanation for an AC generator? Well, it's an inside out magnet. We have the centrifugal divergent magnetism moving in space and time. This necessitates phase induction of the dielectric inertial plane, which is on the outside. Remember the copper, any sort of coil is a dielectric reflector. In the magnet on the left, we have a dielectric inertial plane in the center. But in the generator on the right, the plane is on the outside. We have force and motion going on in the magnet, but is 
also being varied with respect to time. So an inside out magnet, all you have to do is vary the reciprocating phase, centrifugal divergent magnetism with respect to time. You put a drive shaft in the center, a white circle, hook it up to a turning water wheel or wind, vary it with respect to time, closely against your dielectric reflector, and you have power generation. An insight magnet, an inside out magnet, we have at least part of Tesla's intuitive flash. The early phrase in, with respect to starting up an AC generator was churning up the ether. All generation works this way. The plane of inertia on the outside, the magnetism on the inside, which is turned over a period of time against the dielectric reflector, which turns up the ether and produces all the electricity used by the world. So let's take what we've learned about electromagnetism and apply it in the context of QM. So the first thing we hit is the double slit experiment. The double slit experiment is arguably the defining core of QM. Per our aforementioned Richard Feynman, slight modification of his quote, all of QM can be derived from it. It is the source of light as a wave particle duality and of the general notion of duality for photons as well as electrons, slightly larger objects like buckyballs comprised of hundreds of molecules. And thus the entire notion that we have particles that have wave-like properties. So I've got two cases pictured here, the electron case and the photon case, which I, both of which are exactly similar, but let's start with the photon case. So we start with sending a wave through the two slits as such. And what would happen, the wave passes through the slits and diffracts, interfering with itself. And so we have the light uh, bands where trough meets trough or crest meets crest, and the dark bands where there's destructive interference where crest meets trough more statically as such. So we have this pattern of light and dark bands, uh, again represented up in the top picture with the light bands and, and the dark areas between. So that's the standard interference pattern of a wave. With a photon, however, we, for some reason, even though it's a single object, it seems to act in the same way, counterintuitively. For if we started with a BB gun, for example, and shot an object the size of a BB through the slits. And if we were a good shot and, and shot a BB through one slit and then the other slit, we would end up with two dots as shown there in the picture on one of those two bands. If we were a little worse shot and had some vertical slippage up and down, shall we say, we might get uh, then a uh, pattern along those two bands where the dots are, but we will not get an interference pattern of all of the bands as a wave would actually indicate. However, when we go to the photon, then things change. If we send like BBs, photons after photon after photon through the slits, we end up with an interference pattern, the same pattern of fringes. And this led to what seemed to be the inescapable conclusion that photons, even though particles have wave-like properties, and they can act either as objects, as, as um, little particles, objects, or as waves. But all this depends on what light actually is, and more precisely, what a, what a photon is, or an electron, for that matter. For in all of this rumination, it appears on the double slit experiment, light was along the way simply reduced to a stream of photons. When one peruses wiki on the double slit experiment, one comes away with the unavoidable implication that a light wave is a set of photons, a stream of photons. Electromagnetism is mentioned nowhere. And yet one is wondering, how does a photon 
carry and account for all of the properties we have seen of an electromagnetic wave of that interaction of the dielectric and the magnetic that's propagating down with a velocity determined by the ratio through those wires. How does that explain by photons? So we have an elephant in the room, this strange disappearance of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism in this entire subject. And so we start there on light. Yes, unfortunately, an electromagnetic phenomenon. So again, we have the circum circumferential lines of force. And that's the magnetism, which is rotary in character, the phi, conventionally considered velocity. And we have the dielectric lines of force, which are everywhere at right angles, being the antithesis of the magnetic, and in counter space, the psi. One defines the other in a conjugate or mirror sense, crossing points, the electromagnetic. The magnetic lines of force, phi, must surround in closed loops the electrical or electrified, electrified objects. They can never end in space. The ones that appear to be ended in space, I'm just sort of going off the ends of the paper there in the, in the illustration. The dielectric lines of force, the psi, must always terminate into counter space, or what J.J. Thompson called intramolecular dimensions. More conventionally, we would say that one line of force is stuck to an electron in this wire, and another is stuck to a proton in that wire. But no one, as Eric Dollard noted, really knows what's going on inside the wires. And the electricity, that is, the electric field, the field propagation, goes down the lines, between the lines, at the speed of light, C. The ratio of these two quantities, phi, psi, magnetic, dielectric, must always equal the speed of light. This was Maxwell's fantastic discovery. Not only is the speed of light a velocity, but it is also the constant ratio of the amount of dielectric and magnetic energies in the system. The impedance, which is how much this value is actually slowed down, tends to be a numerical value based on the geometry of the lines, but the speed of light has this duality, phi psi. This is at least one of the blind spots in Einstein and relativity. This duality of the electromagnetic field is discovered by Maxwell. In effect, it was never factored in. In fact, in effect, simply disappeared into the notion of empty space. Faraday thought the lines of force were magnetic. Thompson and Heaviside felt the dielectric was primary, and the magnetism was just the, that circling around the electric. For Dollard, it's like a chicken or egg question that's never been fully resolved because the ether has no tangible dimensions. Repeat, the ether has no tangible dimensions. For Wheeler, it's not so much a chicken and egg question, but rather the case that the char that charge always implies discharge. The charge is the dielectric, the discharge is the magnetic. But this does not change Dollard's statement. The ether has no tangible dimensions. We'll keep that in mind. So, Wheeler argued electromagnetic propagation is by definition a coaxial circuit. This is where the notion of the photon comes from. We have our coax cable there pictured at the bottom, the center, center core, the dielectric metallic shield around the dielectric insulator than the plastic jacket. And so traveling along the center of the coax, that center core, uh, we kind of come to the notion of a photon. But rather, it's a pulse perturbation. Take a look at it more deeply. So imagine a coaxial cable, which happens to be heavy size invention. The dielectric is the counterspatial z axis. On the right, we have the z axis dielectric. Around this, electricity and magnetism reciprocate through mutual induction and capacitance. 
So there we have the wave with its electrical, electric and magnetic components at 90 degrees to each other, propagating down the cable with, with the dielectric radio propagation simultaneously along the z-axis. These rebound against the dielectric reflector, reflector, which is actually the metallic shield. So the axis in normal, the z-axis in, in normal theory is considered imaginary. It's simply labeled the direction along which this wave flows. But the axis is no more imaginary than, say, the crankshaft and the pistons that run off the crankshaft. In this analogy, in this mechanical analogy, you have the crankshaft and the components, the pistons, working off the crankshaft, similarly to the magnetic and electric components working off the dielectric. And as Wheeler notes, there would be pulses at points of max induction along this axis, where you see the maximum of the red curve and the blue curves, you have a point of max induction. And so a pulse. So the center conductor has no spatial volume in reality, for it must have instantaneous action at a distance. This is why dielectric impulses have been measured to travel, and in reality, they don't travel at all. We have a rate of induction, but travel infinitely faster than the speed of light. If you eliminate the transverse components, the magnetic and the electric, then of course, you don't have electromagnetic radiation, EMR. You are able to travel then faster than the speed of light. So Ken Wheeler likes to say, to emphasize the point, light is not a wave. For a wave is what something does. A wave is what water does. In this case, the light wave is what the ether does, and specifically the two components of the ether, the dielectric and the magnetic, working in opposition to one another and creating this wave through the ether. So the notion of a photon is very arbitrary, but a tiny fragment of the picture, perhaps but those pulses, invented a construct to explain, quote unquote, light. So let's switch to the electron for a moment. Now Steinmetz, who we saw in part 18, was absolutely instrumental in making it possible to actually build consistently Tesla's AC motor and AC generators, who discovered hysteresis and the various waveforms involved and how to control them, who wrote a whole series of books on electromagnetism, the definitive definitions thereof, uh, had this to say, quote, unfortunately, to a large extent, in dealing with dielectric fields, the prehistoric conception of the electrostatic charge, the electron, on the conductor still exist. That is to say, the visualization of little electrons flowing down a wire. And by its use, destroys the analogy between the two components of the electric field, the magnetic and dielectric. This makes the consideration of dielectric fields unnecessarily complicated. Steinmetz. Heaviside regarded, quote, the flow of electrons in the conductor, unquote, as a veritable psychosis. And J.J. Thompson, as we saw again in number 18, considered the electron, which happened to be his discovery, the terminal end of one unit line of electric induction. So that was their view of what an electron is. The picture, by the way, is of Einstein visiting the GE labs, I think around 1930. Uh, you have Einstein, Tesla, Steinmetz. Ken Wheeler likes to quip that Einstein might have been the only guy there in the picture that didn't have the wherewithal to be part of GE Labs. Interesting comment. So the release of lines of force 
is analogous to attaching 1,000 rubber bands to the floor and releasing them. To call this the flow of electrons would be rather absurd. Discharge is a terminal movement in systems of inductance or dielectric capacitance. Particles do not mediate charges, discharges, magnetism, electromagnetism. Electrons are not objects. They are dynamic principles of discharge, or the dynamic principle of discharge. They are not carriers of charge. So what is really happening when we fire an electron, supposedly from our beam gun? From this perception of the dielectric and the electrons as lines of force, this entire beginning of this experiment has to be rethought. Electricity is ether in the state of dynamic polarization. Magnetism is ether in the state of dynamic polarization upon itself and the radiative termination of the electrical discharge. Dielectricity is the ether under stress or strain. The motions and strains of the ether give rise to electrification, phi times psi equals Q of the, of the electric. The electrons do not mediate these are dielectric and magnetic forces, nor are the ether fields. So to quote Ken Wheeler in his book, magnetism is dimensional, the dielectric is interdimensional, or in, the, in counter space. And only when these two ether fields move against each other over time is there electrification, which is the ether in a modality of dynamic polarization. So this brings us to de Broglie and the double slit. I'm saying de Broglie here when I should be anglicizing it, like I do Bergson and say de Broglie, but who needs consistency? The key here is the subquantum medium. And de Broglie offered a double solution theory for the double slit. Now note, I'm not saying this is the solution, but it is an interesting index towards how wave particle duality must be rethought in the context of just what the electromagnetic actually is. And that's the point here. So in this theory, there are two waves. There's the wave function of Schrodinger, which is just statistical, non-physical, and used to determine the probabilistic results of experiments. And secondly, there is also a physical wave in the, quote, sub-quantum medium, unquote, which guides the particle. In a double slit experiment, the particle always travels through a single slit. The associated wave in the subquantic medium in this vision passes through both slits. As the wave exits the slits, it creates inter wave interference, which alters the direction the particle travels as it exits a single slit. Over time, the particles form an interference pattern. When you shoot enough particles through this double slit, you get the interference pattern. Now there's a notion I have there on the right called strong, de strong detection, or I'll call it the strong detection phenomenon. If you place a detector at the slits, the interference pattern does not form. And de Broglie argues, strongly detecting the particle, exiting the single slit, destroys the cohesion, destroys the cohesion between the particle and its associated wave. The particle continues on the trajectory it was traveling. It does not form an interference pattern. So what might de Broglie's wave in the subquantic medium be? How does it relate to a photon? Light is a propagation to the ether whose rate of inductance is determined by the constant ratio of the amount of dielectric and magnetic energies in the ether medium. That is by the intrinsic duality of this medium. So it's really hard not to think that this subquantic medium that de Broglie is referring to and de Broglie's wave is this disturbance in the medium. It's very hard not to go there because Again, the whole question is, what actually is light? We'd, we'd have to start there before we interpret this experiment. So we ask, what can a photon be other than an aspect 
a fragment of this medium embedded pulse. Again, remembering Ken Wheeler's conjecture that we have pulses running down the Z axis, the dielectric axis of that coaxial circuit. And when asked, how can it possibly be dissociated from this electromagnetic totality? How can a photon be dissociated from this, which is by its very nature then only an aspect of this totality? From, from the propagating disturbance controlled by this ratio of conjugate components, phi and psi, that is light. And given an independent reality then as a massless particle, how does it possibly gain an independent reality? It simply cannot be. I'm not attempting to address the range, the full range of the double slit phenomena here, the veritable fortress of QM. Things like the delayed choice phenomena, quantum erasure, buckyballs, and more. Wiki notes, when you look at the double slit experiment, the hydrodynamic model that appears fairly recent, which is a wave model that accounts for a great deal of the phenomena. And Wiki, interestingly enough, falls back on entanglement and superposition of particles and that superposition entanglement phenomena that this model, that is the hydrodynamic dynamic model, can't handle. So it, there's a bit, bit of backpedaling going. Uh, the forces in the fortress are, are uh, falling back into an entanglement position uh, as, we, as we watch. And yet the ether field, or the quantum fluid as it's now disguised, intuitively implies these entanglement aspects as well. Lurking also in the background, of course, is black body radiation, the source of the notion of quanta in the first place, and the photoelectric effect, which Einstein explained. But long ago, when I first looked at relativity, I ran across wave explanations for these. They exist. I have little doubt that they can be affected and carried through, is my opinion. The point here, though, truly is the elephant. That is the field-based nature of electromagnetism and light. The ether with, with its dielectric magnetic with their ratio yielding the velocity C. That has somehow miraculously, strangely been completely lost in this discussion. And yet points to the, to the start, the very start of, of the discussion where it has to start. I'd note here that Ken Wheeler sprinkles glimpses of new devices and applications via ether-based, EM-based technology throughout this book. In other words, devices based on this whole other vision we've been describing. And if indeed this is carried out, instantiated, realized, then the fortress of QM is going to be under severe assault because what you'll have is an emerging number of devices that simply cannot be explained by QM-based physics. So we come back to the fundamental question, the field. There's no physicality to a field. A field has no quantity. It is not particles. There is nothing by which to measure a field in and of itself. A field is always an ether modality perturbation. In the context of fields, Maxwell's and, well, in actuality, Heaviside's equations, remember Heaviside took the baggage off Maxwell so people could understand it. These equations are invoked as describing a field. We look at the four equations, the circles there, as Ken notes, these are varying time vectors. They're varying as a function of time. They're time-based vectors of change. That is, their magnitudes. Anything you can only define by an effect over a period of time is just a description. You can define a unicorn by saying, this thing leaves footprints in the, in the grass. But we've never ever seen a unicorn. 
So these four equations define some effect, some change, but not the thing in, in itself. An important conceptual point. The ether is inertia, and there is the loss of that inertia. This happens to be described as as Ken argues by an equation one over the five to the minus three or phi minus cubed, where phi cubed four point two three six oh six is an expression over a period of time. But this still does not define what a field is, because a field is not a thing. It is not phenomena. There is nothing, no thing, no phenomena that makes up a field. Faraday, as we noted, thought magnetism was primary. Thompson and Heaviside thought the dielectric was primary. Magnetism just circ circling around the electric. And we noted it seems to be a chicken and egg question, Dollar thought. It's never fully been resolved because, back to this, I emphasize again that ether has no tangible dimensions. The plane of inertia has no coordinates. We saw it is nowhere. It is nowhere. It is not in space. Inertia we saw is pure potential. It is unmanifest. We've hit the non-physical. At the very least, the non-measurable. I note that because when you look at time and free will, the Bergson, up in my right-hand corner there, the essence of this book was time when conceived as duration, that is, as indivisible and differentiable, as each instant reflecting all previous instants, then it does not admit of measurement. It is not something that can, be, that can be measured because measurement is inherently spatial, a spatial operation. But now we're talking, in essence, the virtual, the counterspatial as part intrinsic aspect of the ether and non-measurable, non-physical, if, if we equate physical with measurement. This is curious, for we are always asking how non-physical mind can act upon, can influence the physical brain to act, or in Bergson's framework, how one moves from an intent that is the virtual to an image or schema of the act, coalescing in the brain and body to action. Yet the physical is a manifestation of the non-physical field, the ether. Space is in the ether, an expression from it. The brain is equally in the ether field, embedded in it, an expression from it, has a spatial object. The field is pure potential. Clearly, it affects motion in quote unquote matter. This field is related to Bergson's vision in its time transformation, it's indivisible, non differentiable, and its extent, it is expressed as space, it would be extensity, that is, not discrete points. It can be seen as holographic. It does not conform in any way to the classic metaphysic. We as beings cannot be conceived as separated from it. This is the basis of subject and object being related in terms of time, not space. We as acting beings are that field. This field, this ether field, is clearly far richer in scope than Bergson described. It has a counterspace or counterspatial aspect, even counter time, which we haven't discussed, the dielectric, magnetic, but nevertheless, as we've just seen, it's highly consonant. But it's a different, unregistered, unengaged by theory, by scientists, view of matter. So it's a lot to unpack right, this field and the brain and its operation. But this, in my humble opinion, is the direction we need to explore.
down the road, deep learning, still an interesting subject. In fact, becoming extremely challenging to me insofar as attempting to draw a clear boundary delineation as to where it will end as it runs up against Bergson and Gibson. I called it a fad last time, but the advances that it's making are remarkable, awesome, impressive, and one struggles with this boundary question. Do the boundary indeed exist? There's a notion of temporal consciousness, uh, subject thereof, philosophical approach, more on current memory research. Another one strikes me as Bergson versus time travel, that is Bergson's view of time uh, versus the well-discussed possibility of time travel, yes, no, partially. There's the holographic principle, a current thing in physics that I think one would find quite illustrative, uh, and then something else. So next time, we'll see, leading to a deep learning. Till then, signing off.